very pleased to see David Edger here. Ladies and gentlemen, I saw this uh, world-known architect. I met him for the first time at the end of the 90s in Amsterdam, and there was a gathering organized by the Prince Klaus Foundation. Prince Klaus Foundation, major, major philanthropic foundation in the Netherlands, and there was this young guy uh, hanging out, uh, very curious, very curious to find out what was going on in terms of culture in the whole world, and when I say culture, in many different disciplines. And already then, I detected this ambition, this drive, this curiosity. And this curiosity led you to many, many, many projects. And I think the biggest project of all is how can an architect create a space to congregate, make amends with the past, and look towards the future. And the Abrahamic family house, which is hosting three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and of course Islam, I think is one of uh, the highlights and one of the points of culmination in your entire career. It's not the first time you do this because you're building the cathedral in Accra, in Ghana. And it's not the first time, of course not, that your architecture is community driven, but it always has been. David Edgep. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, I want to quickly just show you um, some, some images on the Abrahamic family house and to just talk about um, some of the founding ideas, really thinking about you know, all the world and our relationship to divinity, our relationship to light, our relationship to the cosmos um, and ourselves, um, and really thinking specifically about the Abrahamic uh, religion um, the, the sort of patriarch of Abraham and the, the sort of the three great religions that have come from it, um, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and even their branches underneath that and the diversity underneath that. And how the, the, this, this trinity of religions has created an extraordinary architectural language across the world. Um, some of the most seminal uh, places that we hold and revere as most sacred for most humans are in uh, are sort of held in the architectures that are in the popular mind. Um, the rituals are understood um, and, and well known, um, and they are profound rituals that are, that are in, incredibly inscribed in our psyche. Some of the spaces, um, some of the monuments in the spaces, the shrines in the spaces are critical to have reflected on. And of course, also connected to light is also um, nature, the gardens, and the importance of gardens in the thinking of spaces of, of a sacred nature. Um, we were very, very um, humbled and honored to have won the competition to design the Abrahamic family house, and the idea was to create um, three temples, I'm calling them temples, three, three worship spaces to Islam, to um, Judaism, to Christianity, um, and then to create a museum that would connect them to talk about their, their, their roots and their connections and to talk about religious, uh, the religious connections across those three faiths, and then to create a, a series of networks and spaces that, um, that basically um, allow for the practice of these three religions to, to happen and also for education and for other support facilities to happen around it. Essentially, the inspiration was to understand that the, the, the three religions really emanate from this extraordinary region and that the architecture of this region, for me, one of the most profound um, ways of dealing with climate moderation, the idea of the courtyard and the vertical tower are this deep inspiration behind this rethinking of, or the thinking of this architecture for the Abrahamic family house. It is a network of courtyards en enclosed in a walled, uh, sort of city with a garden, a roof garden, that connects all three. But in each court, courtyard erupts um, a cube that is 30 meters by 30 meters by 30 meters, each identical, but rotated to its key cardinal um, direction of worship, the Qibla for the mosque, east for the cathedral, and Jerusalem for the, for the synagogue, and each one has an expression and an atmosphere that is to do with the specific rituals 
of the religion uh, articulated internally. The three sections are these. Um, in the mosque, an idea of the colonnade, the vault, and the dome, using 21st century technology, a parametric technology formed into one system, rising from square columns into round columns into vaults and domes. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the synagogue, an idea of the Sukkot, the idea of the sojourn in the desert, the time of being close to, to God, expressed as a, as a fixed temple, a sort of a temple that, is, uh, that has a feeling of a temporal nature, a tent in the desert, covered by palms and leaves, protecting it from the, the harsh environment of the desert. And then in the church, um, an image of, um, of grace and ecstasy by um, uh, really an inspiration from uh, the, temp the, the shrine of St. Peter's, a beautiful sculpture by Benini where it talks about the light of God um, and the radiating arrows that come from the light of God. And that has become a sort of form that actually creates a specific space um, inside. We'll watch the film and then we can carry on. David, anything else we are going to see? No, that's, that's it? it. Okay, that's it. ready for uh, our little discussion. Um, 
we saw it already on the video, but mm. if we're going to zoom in, you see in the far distance, you see the Louvre Abu Dhabi by mm. Nouvelle, you see the National Museum by Norman Foster, which almost looks like an Ark of Norway, by the way, <laughs> combined to the side. And then we know, up, we know that in the far distance, uh, the Guggenheim by Frank Gehry is, is going up. The reason I'm telling is in how far did that inflect, did that, uh, let's say, influence uh, what you are and what you have been thinking of because this is not a museum. This is not a mausoleum. This is a place for encounters. Yeah, no, um, what's really beautiful about this monumental core that's been made by, by the government of Abu Dhabi is that um, it is a place that really speaks about the different cultures of people and, and you know, religion is part of the culture of, of people. And for me, I was very interested in really understanding that relationship, understanding what Frank is going to do absolutely um, uh, at, the other, at the eastern edge, um, what Norman is doing um, in its northern, and, and you know, what, uh, what Jean Nouvel has done on the west. So this dome, this rising sort of wings, as it were, and Frank's articulation of the sort of wind tower, but this incredible comp composition form. I wanted to create something that, um, for me, really distilled Thinking about the history of the three religions, I wanted to really create something that would really distill the essence of the three religions and create a certain purity, mm -hmm. a certain purity to the idea. So for me, making a form that was not, as it were, hybridized um, in its initial silhouette, but a strong kind of geometry that stands as a plutonic form against the context of the movement was really important because um, we have a large site, but actually our buildings are quite modest, but they needed to have a presence that would really um, start to compete, but also not really compete, but complement the relationship of the others, but also have a distinct language that was different. Yeah. Before we start about the experience of these three buildings, mm -hmm. because that's what it is, I, there must have been a very strong a precise brief uh, towards this. I mean, when, when we walked around last night, I was thinking, you know, this, this reminds me of Alberti of the old days, <laughs> that there is somebody there who says, this is what I want. How does that work? No, I mean, it, it's a once in a generation type of project and the, the evolution of it has been, you know, really thought about by an incredible council about what is required. So the brief was very thorough about what was needed, what the overlaps were, but the interpretation of it was something that we really brought to the table. Um, but, you know, for me, it sort of unfolded itself by talking, you know, I love hearing the talks that were had earlier, but in a way, if architecture is complicit in making difference, which is what it is, you know, you know religions want to express their identity, so they create an architecture that's to do with their, themselves, and, they, and that becomes propagated through history, and architects propagate it, and it becomes a style. Um, and in a way, this is a moment where the reverse was being asked. So how do you now talk about all the things that are the common traits, but then how do you now bring that into a new form? So if we've been spending centuries going one way, this is a moment where we now think about spending a bit of time thinking about what connections might be, because they are connected. Their patriarchy is this, this but why figure. Do you, why want to make your life so difficult. I mean, you could have made one building, single building, I think some of my for competitors these three did. religions. I mean, isn't, wasn't it going to be something almost like evident to make one building? No, you yeah. wanted to make three, why? I think that the idea for me is not to somehow morph and make a new religion. This is not about making a sort of quasi triptych new religion. This is about respecting these three extraordinary religions with their histories and their cultures and their evolution, but to bring them into a space of dialogue and to bring them into a space where they see each other. Um, so that really was important. So for me, it was critically important that they did not become one building. And I think that that's a very different step uh, for me. Uh, that they had, that they have their three spaces, but they're interconnected. But they do have their separate entrances. They have separate entrances, but you can weave through the network mm -hmm. into each other. I mean, one, what is amazing for me is that there's only maybe a few medieval cities that you might see this, maybe Cairo and I don't know, many other places in the world, where you would, through the patina of history, see a synagogue, a mosque, and a church together. So most people in the world, uh, or in this, sort of, in this sort of Abrahamic world have not been in that environment where that relationship is. So I think this is a really profound 
profound, and I can't say that word enough, a moment where architecture is brought in to really coordinate this, this incredible moment to allow the rituals of daily life to happen in relation to each other, but also for visitors to be able to go. You know, most people, some people haven't even been in a mosque. You know, you may be a Christian, you've not been in a mosque, you've not been in a synagogue. And the idea that you could on, you know, go see all three or go worship in them is really powerful. Separate entrances, three different buildings. Where are they going to be able to congregate? Because uh, we have been seeing last night uh, the very intricate system of courtyards. It's really made us think of a, a Medina, of a medieval city. Where are they going to be able to interact with one another? So when, within the courtyard system that is the network, there is a room that they all are directly connected to, which is where the museum is. So from the courtyard of each uh, temple, if I can say that, you directly enter into the museum which talks about the faith and the connections of the faith. And from that, you're able to then rise onto the podium. The podium is a new ground, really. It's, uh, I call it, for me, it's a new ground for all. And uh, there's a grand stair and ele an elevator that brings you up onto that podium. And that, in the center of that garden, is a gathering space for several hundred people to be able to gather. And the idea is that that space is also a space for debate and dialogue, for music, for discussions, for, or for just sojourning in the beautiful evenings that you have in this region. You have used the word profoundness, you have mm -hmm. used the word ritual. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the buildings that I quoted before, they're all practically adjacent to the water. Your building is not, but water is playing a very important role in your building, but in a very different way, and this brings to mind also that you once said, we Africans, especially Ghanians, we are afraid of water. We are turning <laughs> our back to the ocean. Water. No, water, water is profoundly important in, in all of the rituals of the three faiths. Um, and water is also about this region as well. And so for me, it was profoundly important that um, the three elements, light, nature, and water, are there. Architecture is really a kind of in-between. You know, the, material, the materiality of the architecture is not really important to me. It's just a system that is articulating the voids and the light and giving presence to nature that you see around you. And it was really important to me that a spiritual place connected you to the world too, that you were not removed, but you also understood your relationship to the earth, to the elements of the earth, and to the kind of extraordinary um, sort of, you know, heavens that we look at in, the, in, the, like, in our conceptions of divinity. That it's, when you're in the courtyards, the, the world and the cities around you and the cars and everything disappear, and you are just looking upwards. So you have this moment where almost everywhere, with, once you enter, you gaze towards the light. You, have, you are forced to look at the light. And then you have respite with a grove of olives, um, an incredible you know, hibiscus plant or whatever it might be. From the very beginning, you have mm. been very interesting in what I call colors of, and the texture, the tectonics of architecture. I yeah. mean, you made a lot of black cladded buildings, uh, which you probably can explain, but this time mm. you're working with the colors of the earth, of this earth. Yeah. And uh, the tectonics of these buildings is something you really would love to touch and not just the walls, but also the mesh wire, the copper or bronze mesh wire in the synagogue, the wood in uh, the church, and then uh, incredible, the mashrabiyas built out of stone in the mosque. How important was it for you to look and to make sure that people want to touch the tectonics? Well, <laughs> I, I, I always think in architecture that there are layers that you build, and especially a place where people will spend a lot of time, I'm always very interested in the way in which one makes details that reveal themselves as you spend time. So I'm not always interested in the way details reveal themselves immediately. It's not about the quick sensation. But as you spend time, you start to notice how things are put together or how things are brought together, or certain, you start to understand the meaning of certain materials um, and why they're in, in the context. So I, I spend a lot of time in my work after I've understood the kind of the primary moves, the way in which I'm making the, the, the parts of the architecture that are about the, the duration, 
the duration of a body in space, so, and also the materiality that is next to the body when you're in space, and how does that make you feel? It's a very important part of how I work. Speaking mm. about, uh, you want almost to touch. Uh, the, <laughs> I'm not encouraging anyone to walls, touch anything. <laughs> uh, but it's true, because uh, you're not talking only about these fantastic places mm. for gathering, but yesterday night you said, just every time you took us to the service spaces. And when I say yeah. that you talk about the service spaces, it's in fact an expression of an amazing simplicity. This is not a building, this is not a series of buildings which is going to scare us. This is a building we want to be, we want to embrace the building and the buildings are embracing us. And you're using the word service spaces. It's a kind of normalcy, a kind of simplicity. It's, it's a very humble, building, how important was that kind of gesture for you? Humility is critical. I think humility in, in religion is critical. Um, humility in religion is critical. Yeah. I like to hear that. You mm. too? Yeah. David Edge. David. Um, I mean, none of the spaces for us were, you know, we, of course the temples were the key spaces, but none of the spaces were being brought down. And in, in my mind, design is not about the amount of money you spend. You know, the criticality of the space is not about the money you spend, but it's about the effort of the thought. So are you thinking, how much have you thought about that space that is the background to the main space? And with my team, this is what we always do. Are we, have we given it enough thought? And can we stand back and say, this has got everything it needs to do the work? So. In, with the synagogue, for instance, the daily shul is just as important, and it's a small room to hold 10, 15 people, is just as important as the main temple. In the, in the mosque, the ablution spaces, where male and females go to ablute, is given as much love, and I could do a, a little essay on that. In the, in, the, in, the, in the church, the baptistry, which is used you know, for that incredible time, is, is as articulate as the main chamber, and it's almost its own work. And that is really important to me, that every, every part of this project really is given a kind of democratization of intensity. Mm. Of another, intensity. Example, another example of that simplicity, mm. um, humility, and, and this a, a kind of practic, practical feeling are the three signposts. Mm. Uh, also, they are, you know, we, we, they are almost part of, and I'm sorry, of the traffic system, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, what was the idea behind this signpost? Because I saw also a signpost in your designs for the cathedral in Accra, because this, as I said before, it's not your first religious building. You're also working on the National Cathedral of Ghana in Accra. And there is another signpost. So, you know, w when we started off, we, we didn't have it, but we, we in discussions, we realized that the spire is a really important element in the articulation. Um, and we wanted the, we, you know, there's thinking that we wanted the buildings to also have a signifying element um, that was to do with understanding the important iconography of the cross, the important iconography of the crescent, of, of, the, of the, the, you know, the, 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 hold, the candle holder in the synagogue. The name's gone out of my head a second. But th this iconography is critical to the understanding and the perception of these three uh, sort of incredible um, uh, sort of religious spaces. So it felt as though the project was not complete. And as we worked with it, we realized that actually also what it allowed us to do was to make a kind of a, kind of a, a sort of pillar. There are three pillars for me that stand sort of very strong pillars. They're sort of triangular pillars, three elements, sort of tripped you know, it's a geometry. And then they sign out with this illumination of, this, of the symbol. And that symbols are important. In another panel, somebody was asking me, how do you measure success? And I was saying, definitely not through KPIs, which we <laughs> no. see everywhere. That, so, I mean, how will you, as an architect, measure the success of what you're doing here? What is an ideal situation for you? What is an ideal situation in terms of the users of your architecture? What is your measure of success? Uh, for me, and it's always been from the first public building I ever made, um, you know, I, my first public building I saw, um, it, it, was for, it, was, it was a library and, you know, uh, some teenagers went in and um, I overheard, I was standing in the back, they didn't know who I was. 
And um, I, this guy was talking to another guy, and he talked about wanting to meet his girlfriend there. <laughs> and that blew my mind, because for me, that was like the kind of incredible moment when you know, the mall or the kind of other spaces were not where he wanted to meet and show off mm -hmm. to his, his love, mm -hmm. but, but the idea that he would go to a library. So for me, the architecture had successfully created the armature to bring him back into what I think is a really important topology. And for me, with the Abrahamic, I just, I'm just, I want to see all generations just use it without even thinking. Mm -hmm. That it's, you know, for me, it, it's so important that it's multi-generational. I want to see people in their, you know, elder years and very young people running around and using it. I mean, and also I'd like it, I would really love that, you know, people who don't have faith to really feel very comfortable here. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to me that the place is also a place that that welcomes people who don't have faith and doesn't make them feel like they're awkward, but brings them into it. And I think that that's what it's about. It's about that dialogue for me. For me, the Abrahamic family house mm. is also an expression of uh, tolerance, mm -hmm. of solidarity, mm -hmm. of congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an educational building, in fact. And, and mm. throughout your career, uh, the idea stores, no, you didn't call them libraries, you called them the idea stores. Uh, through your career, you have been seeing also museums, the National uh, Museum of African American History, uh, Smithsonian in, in Washington is a good example. You're working on other educational buildings. There might be an educational idea, an educational design further down in, in Sharjah in the future. It, it, is, is this something you're really interested in, this whole idea about architecture and education? So I, I think that there's a generation of us, and I'll, I'll put it in line with this, that are interested in remaking the city. That we firmly believe that the city has failed in a lot of its, its production. Um, and I think it's, it's, it was obsessed with um, industrialization, the production of architecture, a kind of universality, modernism. Um, and all these have incredible, incredibly important tenets in them. But what we now realize at the beginning of the 21st century, that the city is more than just a place, even for a nation state. It is a, it is a, it is a, a window into the way in which we are all inter interconnected. It is a space where the multicultural idea of our planet manifests itself most beautifully. Um, and I think that the idea of the city really has to now be thought more than just a kind of idea of a local but as something that is a, is a device that starts to think about the other and how the other is welcome in its space. And I think that architecture has not been very good with that. And so I think that there's a generation of us who were born as travelers and nomads, who felt displaced, who now think that we need to really create a world that our children will feel comfortable in, mm -hmm. you know, and not have the same traumas, if I can say that, that we've had. When, when Colas was publishing mm -hmm. Almanac, mm -hmm one and two, a catalogue really of mm. the architecture in the Gulf since the 60s and the 70s. He was saying we have to take that architecture serious. When I compare uh, what went on and going on in Dubai, and I don't want to drive on competition, uh, I think here it's much more classical. Uh, you are using often the words classical, and last night you were comparing what, what you guys, I mean, the, the, the Garys and, and the Jean Nouvelles and the Norman Fosters and you are doing is almost like a kind of Washington mile. It's, uh, you were using the word Washington, uh, and you were using the word classical. What, what's, what's the difference? So for me, when I say classical, I'm, I'm meaning not, new, not, not the Renaissance. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking about a kind of primal sort of state where a nation makes architecture to, you know, to, to talk about the fundamentals of its civilization and its society. So classical for me in that way. Um, what I love about what Sadiat Island is, and there's not many nations where you see, you see many nations building a museum or building a beautiful building or building a really fantastic building, but to actually make this concept of a, what I call a monumental core that actually really puts out there exactly what your civilization stands for 
is really the move for me. That's, that's really the powerful move, more than the buildings. It's the statement that you make. You know, we spend a lot of time making malls and skylines and urban, but actually the cultural core and making a monumental core in any civilization is probably the height of what you can really do to express what your civilization is about. And that's what I'm really excited about, about what um, the government of uh, the UAE is doing. Our time is up. Ladies and gentlemen, David Adjett, Portrait of a Nation. Thank you, David.